Great. I think the uh, relevance of, to personal relevance will become apparent at the very last slide. So bear with me until then. Um, what I'm going to take you through is something of a personal biographical research history because it starts um, with something not related to any kind of research on sounds in, that you conjure in your head. It starts with research from uh, so now it's 15 years that I've been working with musicians trying to play together in different cities at the same time. Actually quite relevant to some of the discussions I've heard here too. It's like when you have multiple humans, humans like to synchronize. Synchronize either for turn taking, but in music, synchronize for the beat, right? So it has to be tight. And if you're using internet for synchronization, there's a lot of technical aspects to overcome. This has been a goal, it's been a dream for, uh, like I said, you know, good 15 years. Um, here's, here's an example, if you can bring the sound up. From wideband to 4G mobile internet, the fastest next generation internet at home and on the go. Dan! Time Warner Cable, we're moving technology forward to bring you back to the band. Okay, and it's surprising how many ISP advertisements use this theme to try and market their wares. Um, I, have, I have several of these, in fact. Um, this one's a little bit dicey because if you look in, and I've done this, you go in and still frame it, you can't actually find any wires attached to their instruments. So it's, it's a little bit of a fabrication in the studio. However, as I said, we've been developing this and it, it does work. Here's a, another session um, just uh, pulled off of YouTube and this is a Bay Area trio rehearsing. <laughs> And what we've noticed over studying this as a, as a new practice, a new medium for music, uh, has a lot of use cases that uh, you know, are predictable. The last one's kind of my favorite one when, when some producer actually told me, you know, I really like this technology because I won't have to be in the same room with this singer that I actually need to work with. Um, uh, differences though between this internet medium and the, the more traditional ones uh, stem from things that you probably already know. Uh, first of all, I can be playing with somebody in New York. The sound that I'm getting is absolutely uncompressed, unchanged. It's the same sound that went into the wire in New York. There's no distance cue. I can't tell how far away that person is. Uh, if we add visuals to it, the latency in coding, decoding vision, visual or you know, computer graphics, camera work, is longer than audio. So, so it's the reverse of your conductor on stage who hits the downbeat and everybody plays with it. Uh, and the sound actually comes later because of the latency of sound and air on the network. It's the other way around. The, the sound gets there before the image. Um, but as a uh, point out here, that we're really interested uh, early, this is back in 2003, would there be some sort of magic number that we're trying to achieve in order to guarantee that musicians can synchronize and hold a beat together? And what would that number be? So we uh, began a study uh, here in a studio. We had musicians uh, parked in studios apart from each other. They couldn't see each other and they were asked to clap a rhythm together, something that we gave them. And uh, turn the sound up good because you're gonna wanna hear two people clapping together this rhythm now. Uh, it's very simple, this is, this is not really music, this is more of a kind of test, just diagnostic thing. And here's what they sound like. And we don't have stereo. <laughs> that's, that's mono, unfortunately. So um, if I did it again, I'll clap with them myself. Uh, 
that's the composite rhythm. And that's what they're trying to achieve. And they're trying to hold that together. Um, we did this for delays that are extremely short, up to delays that would be somewhere between California and the Azores. 78 milliseconds is a very long time. Uh, it's also equivalent to 78 feet in air, plus or minus. So this is, this is talking you know, a third of a football field. And uh, when you listen to that same test at such a long delay, this is what you get. And you may not hear it well. Sean, yeah. are you having trouble? Like, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's something going on. So, so we had to tell the subjects that indeed things will fall apart. It's not the fault of your partner. They probably know how to clap, um, but you know we're manipulating this so that we'll find out. And indeed, uh, this is the set of trials and their tempos. So in this bottom right corner, that's the tempo that you just heard deaccelerating as a line kind of going down. Um, we had some work to you know, actually statistically fit that. The green line is human performance under conditions of delay. It's a very straight kind of uh, almost monotonic tempo decrease as delay increases. And it's, it's, um, it's extremely good fit. And this experiment has been replicated several times in other places. And a student here, uh, Juan Pablo Caceres, was interested in creating a synthetic clapper. So could he, could he come up with an algorithm that mimics how one party in this coupled situation performs with delay? In fact, uh, the red line is the results of his best shot at an algorithm to do that. And what it shows, between the green and the red, our algorithm isn't accounting for everything that we can do as humans in, in a face of some sort of more difficult uh, situation, acoustical situation like that. So that got me thinking. This is leading to the subject today. Um, I know as a musician that I'm always sort of thinking ahead. You know, I'm, uh, If I'm reading a score, I'm reading a bar ahead. I'm a cellist, so I, you know, I'm, I'm just, from the early age, that was how you did it. You know, you're, you're kind of forward in time, and there's a lot of planning going on in your mind partly acoustical, you know, you're hearing the sound, partly motor because you're sort of planning the moves you're going to make. Um, so let's look at, at this you know, video from the beginning again. Look, look at how much of this fellow's body is involved in playing a note. And look how cyclical it is. So there's this, there's, there's almost like a flywheel that's in motion. And, and you know where it's going to be you know, in, in, in some future time. Um, you know, and, and musicians just can't help doing that. You know, when you slow it down, it's pretty apparent. You know, and they're they're they're, they're not exaggerating. This is, and I, I get blamed for being too exaggerated when I play too. I mean, it's a um, it's a job hazard. Um, so, so if that planning is going on, you know, where do we where do we relate to the instant moment of time? And you know, going back into some literature, I found some very interesting improvisers inspiration from the early phenomenologists and uh, particularly there's a, uh, a thought about time that William James had, had uh, conjured which, which is, uh, has, has come back in the literature many times, this idea of the specious presence. Um, think of it in contrast to a computer clock. So if we were building a computer and it has extremely coordinated activity that's happening with this slice of time called now, like this. And we build computers so we know exactly when something will happen, what comes before, what it triggers, what comes after. Human time is extremely different from that. It's, it's what James is describing as a kind of moving blob, which is expanding and contracting and has objects forming and going away. And some of those are going to be objects in your mind. Um, and this is this, is this notion of thinking and sound, which uh, I realized when I started kind of looking closer at it, is more of my acoustical experience than perceived sound. I think, I think my auditory imagination is 
a greater fraction of it is sounds in my head than it is sounds coming in through hearing. And we don't have a very good word for that, at least in the English language. Uh, we, we talk about visualization, visualization, imagination, imagination, but what's the word for sound? Um, uh, you know, there, there was a term called odd aisles about 100 years ago, and these were folks who had a very profound auditory imagination. And I'd never heard of this word before. I'm in the business, you know, so it's, it, we don't have that. Um, it's more recently than earlier. It's being studied in, um, in a neuroscience and a behavioral science way. And uh, Herholtz here is showing familiar tunes and doing imaging studies to see if there's different brain activations for imagined sound of a, or imagined tune versus a perceived tune. Um, I'm going to... Um, kind of introduce you to the particulars of sound for a second here too. When we talk about sound or music, we talk about loudness and these other dimensions, pitch, timbre, rhythm, location of a sound coming in. And these are perceived, you know, when a sound happens, you say, okay, well, that was a sharp click and it was over here and there was only one of them. If you imagine that, do those same dimensions hold up? You know, if, if I told you to close your eyes and imagine, you know, maybe spin around a few times and then imagine where that snap happened, uh, is it as accurate as your perceived image of that sound? So borrowing from another researcher, I'm calling these quasi-something, quasi-timbre. Uh, quasi um, and timbre is what gives us the different qualities. This, this would refer to a study where timbres of different single notes are being compared. Um, and Angela, uh, Andrea Halpern had asked for sort of rating studies that brought out these two dimensions about similarity. So here's the tenor voice when it's a perceived sound. You play the subject, a, a note sung by a tenor, the same note on a trumpet, and compare their similarities. Now, if you ask them to imagine the same sounds, things shift. And it's this shift that's kind of the topic of this research now. It's, it's like, what's the difference between a perceived sound and an imagined sound in its sort of quasi-acoustical sense, right? So this, if I go back and forth, you can, uh, you can see you know, the perceived layout and then the shift where these things move. And it seems almost regular, and that's something I don't know anything about yet, but that shift seems to have a orbit to it. Um, in, uh, in Andrea's own work, she's looked at the uh, neural correlates as well, and this is another imaging study that's giving you some of the, the same reference. Um, I decided to try something uh, on a different tack in this study, and this is where I'll sort of finish off with what I've, I've accomplished by trying to get evidence supported by just lots of people's self-reports, right? So this is, an, you know, we're talking about things happening in the mind. How do you get evidence about that? If you're not measuring them in a scanner, another way to do it is just to ask them what they experience and just get something to a level where you know, might even call it believable, I think you just have to have a lot of these uh, self-reports, you know, and uh, that, that was the notion of using uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk to reach a lot of people. Um, just, just briefly, Mechanical Turk is a, is a crowdsource task um, system where you can be a Mechanical Turk worker and sign up for these micro jobs, you know, and in my case, it's just answer a survey. It'll probably take you five minutes. You get paid at the end of it. Uh, at any given time, if you went on Mechanical Turk right now, there'd be probably 200,000 tasks available to, to engage. And uh, you get a significant, you know, you get an equally large number of workers are kind of looking for things to do. So all of this happens in parallel, and it was astonishing to me. So I got my first study done in the time it took me to cook some eggplants on my stove. I mean, it was like I had 40 results in 20 minutes, and it would have taken me two months at Stanford to run that many subjects <laughs> one by one. 
So it's, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, Okay, then I'll go back to uh, my part. <laughs> but uh, what, was, what was kind of reassuring was that I'm getting very, very strong positives in this thing. It's, it's, a, it's a trend that leads to, hey, maybe this is a good way to uh, start asking these questions uh, or probing around a field where I don't even know what the questions are yet. I mean, this is very early stage stuff. Um, here's another kind of thing that you might imagine. Um, if you try this for yourself just now. And it's apparently very easy for, hopefully for you, but for, certainly for my uh, assistants on the Am Amazon Turk platform. And very strongly inside your head, which, which is interesting, because where's that stage then? You know, what, it, uh, and what does this mean about location? So I, did, I won't go into details on how that played out. Here's, here's the most recent study. Um, I was looking at the potential for learning about just one of the really common gradations that we have in, in sound, which is loud and soft. We obviously can hear loud and soft. Can we imagine loud and soft as well as we can hear it? And uh, if it's different, this is composer stuff going on now, if it's different, could I compose sounds that you're going to hear that resemble the sounds that you would actually have imagined instead? So that's, that's kind of my, my nefarious end game at this point, which I haven't achieved. But uh, we'll go through the... the um, just so you see how one of these jobs uh, looks when it's online. So this would be a, a survey presentation. The first slider plays the reference. Amazon, 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 Thanks. Amazon, About right Amazon. there. Okay, so that's, that's a reference sound. Here's, here's a, a sound that doesn't really come from nature. I wanted something that was its own quality that could be from loud to soft. So that's soft. And here's the next louder. So I asked them to, to gauge which of, you know, if, if one of these randomly presented loudnesses was louder or softer than me saying Mechanical Turk in the first clip. And here's, uh, here's a very nice loudness rate, um, ranking that's coming from the study and it correlates with the physics of the sound pretty nicely. Now do the same thing in your imagination. And this is a bit of a trickier thing. They have to imagine the reference. They have to compare their imagined sound to their imagined reference and so on. And what comes out is those two scales then. The red scale is the imagined scale. The blue scale is the, the heard, perceived scale. And uh, they are different. Um, again, testing for the clarity and the test, I think there was, there was no real difficulty with doing this on the part of the subjects. They seem to be able to you know, make these um, judgments. And the clarity of the judgments was, was pretty strong. So to me, the next step is then, you know, can we, um, can we sort of transition this inner outer boundary? And uh, the trick to attempt that 
is then uh, basically back to the data that I've got, I'll just skip to that, is find the place in these two scales where they map and match and then, um, and then make a remapping that'll give me the, um, the, the way to transition between the inner world and the outer world as uh, probably we'll do in some future piece of music. Um, so that's, that's the study. These, this was done with lots of advice and help locally and afar and uh, particularly with thanks to the, the probably 150 respondents to the survey that worked online too. And this is where this becomes the personal relevant relevance thing. So I'll be closing, but I'll leave this slide up for a moment. I had a little text field at the end. It said, give me your comments on this study. Uh, any suggestions? Did you, you know, what do you, what do you think was going on? And the responses I got were, just incredible. They were, they were like, if I got these kind of responses to a piece of music I wrote, I'd be a really, really happy guy. You know? so, so, you know, people were like who had never thought they had an, I mean, they never imagined having an imaginary voice or an inner voice. We're, we're hearing it for the first time. Um, and there were lots of these. So, thank you. That's my presentation. So, so.